Hey guys, welcome to the first episode of Land Speed Legends. I'm Sam Hawley, author of Speed Duel, the inside story of the land speed record in the 60s, that golden era of competition on the Bonneville Salt Flats. And most recently, I've written the authorized biography of Craig Breedlove, Ultimate Speed. In this series, I'm going into the land speed archives that I've collected over the years to bring you the coolest stories about the guys who've gone after the record. I'm talking Craig Breedlove, Art Arfons, Walt Arfons, Mickey Thompson, Nathan Ostage. We're going to be doing it all. To kick things off, episode one, let's go back to August 1963 when Craig Breedlove burst onto the scene to set a fantastic new record of 407.45 miles per hour and win the record for the United States. I know, I know, you've already heard that story, so I'm not going to repeat it. Instead, I'm going to tell you about Craig's secret weapon, the hush-hush piece of equipment on his Spirit of America jet car that gave him a huge advantage over everyone else. That's coming up. But first... Pull the string! Pull the string! You heard Bella. Pull the string! Subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss a minute of the land speed stories that I have in store. Alright, so here we have Craig Breedlove's Spirit of America jet car in its 1963 configuration. The previous year, the car didn't have a tail fin. That was the most noticeable difference. I'll do an episode later about that. Craig at Bonneville in 1962. Total disaster. But right now, it's 1963. Spirit of America has a brand new tail fin. It's got the steerable nose wheel. And it's got something else hidden under its aluminum skin. Now, in land speed racing, the aerodynamics of the car, the action of the air passing over and under the car, is hugely important. Of course, obviously. At high speeds, the vehicle becomes more and more like an airplane. The air passing over and under the car can lift it up or push it down. If it lifts it up too much, the nose could lift right up off the ground, the car flips over, and there's a good chance you're going to get killed. If the air pushes the car down too much, if there's too much downforce, well, at the very least, that's going to create a bunch of extra drag and slow you down. And if the downforce is extreme, it could blow out a tire and boom! Again, there's a good chance that you're going to get killed. So the trick in land speed racing is to find that sweet spot, that tiny sliver where lift and downforce are in balance. That's where Craig's Spirit of America secret weapon came in. He got it mainly thanks to Walt Sheehan, an engineer at Lockheed that Craig recruited back in 1962 to design the car's air ducts. Walt then came up with an additional idea of installing strain gauges on the car's front and back wheels and wiring them up to a data acquisition recorder out of an F-104 Starfighter, the same fighter that Walt had helped design at Lockheed. So every time Craig took a run at Bonneville, these strain gauges are measuring the amount of downforce on the front and back wheels. They're actually photoelectric cells that pivot left or right depending on how much force is acting on the car. As they pivot back and forth, they shine a beam of light on a spool of photographic paper in the data recorder, exposing a line on the paper as it winds past. This is actual footage, by the way, of Walt Sheehan working on the car. See that red box directly in front of him? That's the data recorder. 
Walt unloads the spool of photographic paper from that box, and he develops it in the sink back at his motel room in Wendover, so he can see exactly how much downforce is acting on each of Spirit of America's wheels. Is the car experiencing too much lift? Is its nose getting dangerously light? Is it at risk of flying? Or is the nose pressing down too hard? Is downward pressure slowing it down? Walt's photographic strip tells Craig exactly what Spirit of America is doing. And Craig can adjust the car's aerodynamics the next day, keeping it right there in that sweet spot between downforce and lift. That gave him a huge edge over his land speed rivals, including Art Arfons. Here's Craig. Nobody else had it. I mean, it, you know, we were just light years ahead of them from a technological standpoint. I mean, nobody had even thought about stuff like that. And that's why Goodyear was so successful is that we never loaded the tires up. I mean, Firestone had great tires, but, uh, you know, they just did, the technology didn't exist amongst the uh, operators of, uh, that Art had. Here's one more clip from later in the same interview. That car was the first competitive car ever in motorsports to have data acquisition put into it. That had never been done before. We were able to adjust the lift on that car and know what it was, where, for example, uh, for art, they had nothing in the car. And they kept blowing those rear tires, and obviously they were overloading them. But they didn't know the the magnitude of it, and they didn't, they weren't, uh, you know. I mean, we were we, that car was. Uh, at, I mean, at, at that time, it was uh, completely ahead of everybody. So Craig Breedlove knew exactly what Spirit of America was doing on the salt, aerodynamically speaking. But how was he able to make adjustments? How was he able to respond to the data right there on the spot? Here's where Spirit of America's second innovation came in, the other half of Craig's secret weapon. Take a look at the car's rear axles. Notice something? They're shaped like an airfoil, like the wings of an airplane. And just like wings, they had flaps. They were crude flaps, but they served the same purpose. On the trailing edge of either axle were aluminum tabs that could be bent up or down to adjust the lift of the car. To keep it locked on the ground, but not pressing down too hard, which would create too much friction and rob it of speed. A guy named Bernie Pershing, an aerodynamics expert that Shell Oil brought in, he did the actual calculations and figured out how much to bend the tabs, either up or down. These adjustments, they were extremely subtle, just a fraction of an inch. But that's all it took. It kept Spirit of America perfectly in the aerodynamic sweet spot, locked on the ground, but not too hard. Now, maybe you're thinking, hey, that sounds kind of like what's going on with the spoiler on the back of a race car. And you'd be right. Here's Craig again, talking about race car driver and racing innovator Dan Gurney, who introduced something called the Gurney Flap, or Wicker Bill, to Indy cars in 1971. Gurney learned that in Indianapolis, what they called a Wicker Bill, they could put an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch plastic piece of trim on the, the wings on the back of those Indy cars, I mean, they learned what we already knew, oh. and, and, and that became known as a wicker build on a light car like that. I mean, it really, you know, they just a little tiny thing on the trailing edge would change the lift over the whole, whole uh, wing section. You know, that was his advantage. I mean, the people looked at it, didn't look any different than the rest of the cars oh. out there, and most people would say, well... What the hell is that? You know, that can't make any difference, mm -hmm. really, but narrow. And then, they, then, of course, they got onto it. So, Craig Breedlove was using what was essentially a gurney flap, 
or Wicker Bill, at Bonneville, almost a decade before it showed up at Indy. Boom! Right there. Can you see it? Like with its onboard data acquisition, Spirit of America was way ahead of its time. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. Next week, we're going to be taking a look at Art Arfons and the Green Monster and asking the question, what was Art's cruelest record? You don't want to miss this one, guys, because I've got secret tapes. Stay tuned.